The town of Kichevo, located in present-day Macedonia, is known for its vast grasslands, modest economy, outdated industries, and high unemployment rate. Amidst this backdrop in the 1990s, Vlado Tanesky emerged as one of the most trusted correspondents for local newspapers. His writings were highly sought after, covering sports, politics, culture, and the economy. Nothing happening in Kicheva was beyond his scope, not even crime. Between 2005 and 2008, a series of murders took place, and no other journalist in Macedonia had the detailed information that Tanesky possessed. This peculiarity led the Kicheva police to knock on his door on July 20th, 2008. They wanted to know how he had access to information known only to investigators. The answer left many stunned. Vlado Taneski was born in 1952 in Kichevo, a town that is now part of modern-day Macedonia, but was then within the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. He was the middle child among three siblings in a very conservative and strict family. His father, a World War II veteran who worked as a night watchman, was not hesitant to use physical discipline, often resorting to his belt. However, physical punishment wasn't the only form of abuse young Vlado endured. His mother, who worked as a cleaner at a hospital, was equally harsh. She had a particular animosity toward Vlado, treating him worse than his siblings. She regularly insulted and yelled at him and would hit him without any reason, leaving him with frequent nightmares from the beatings. Over time, Vlado's fear of his mother turned into deep frustration and hatred for not standing up to her, later describing her as a malevolent woman. As soon as he was old enough, Vlado left home to pursue his studies and create a better life for himself. He graduated as a metallurgical worker and became involved with a local communist youth organization. Moving to Croatia, he joined the League of Communists of Yugoslavia, but eventually found his true passion in literature. In 1973, at a poetry reading, he met Vesna, a law student. They quickly fell in love, and while she finished her studies, Vlado pursued a career in journalism. After they both graduated, they got married, had two children, and returned to Kichevo. However, their happiness was short-lived. Vlado's aging parents needed care, and despite his strained relationship with them, he felt morally obligated to help. He moved his new family into his parents' home. During these years, Vlado proved to be an excellent husband, son, and father. He worked as an editor for the local radio and later as a reporter for newspapers like Nova Macedonia in Skopje, the capital. However, he faced a significant problem, fierce competition among journalists. This pressure led him to plagiarize articles, presenting his colleagues' work as his own. Not only was he discovered, but he was also accused of seeking to create a sensation among readers. As if things couldn't get worse in 2002, Vlado's father took his own life, which had a profound emotional impact on him. After this tragedy, Vlado's relationship with his mother deteriorated significantly, resulting in daily arguments and shouting matches. While he continued to be a loving and caring person towards his wife and son, the unbearable living situation with his mother ultimately strained his marriage. During the same period, Vlado lost his job as a reporter at Nova Macedonia due to staff cuts. In 2003, his mother died from an accidental overdose of medication, but this didn't improve his situation. By then, his marriage was already falling apart, compounded by serious financial difficulties following his dismissal. In early 2004, Vlado and Vesna separated. She got a promotion and moved to Skopje with their children, while Vlado chose to stay in a small, secluded cabin in Kichevo. Despite knowing that his freelance reporting would not provide sufficient income, 
Vlado continued his work. He isolated himself in his cabin, equipped with a telephone and a typewriter, occasionally using a computer. Each day, he waited for something newsworthy to happen in the small town. At one point, he thought, if no one else was going to take action, perhaps he should. On November 16, 2004, 64-year-old Mitra Simjanovska disappeared from her home. When police arrived at her residence, they found only a trail of blood in the kitchen. Two months later, on January 12, 2005, a sanitation worker discovered her unclothed body inside a plastic bag at a landfill in Kichevo. The body showed clear signs of violence. The autopsy revealed that Mitra had been bound, tortured, abused, and strangled. She had been dead for less than two weeks, indicating she had been held captive for over 40 days. News of the murder quickly spread to the media. One of the journalists who arrived at the crime scene to gather information for an article was none other than Vlado. He interviewed some of Mitra's family and friends, gaining insights into the investigation. His report caused a stir in the press. Vlado not only recounted the statements of the investigators and the victim's family, but also provided details about the interior of Mitra's home and suggested the body might have been dragged to the kitchen. While his colleagues dismissed these details as mere speculation, the reality was that the police were aware of such specifics. The strange part was that Vlado had no official access to this information. However, this did not raise significant suspicion at the time, at least not enough to consider him a suspect. The authorities initially focused their investigation on Ante Risteski and his friend Igor Mirsheski, two criminals who had previously robbed, tortured, and murdered an elderly man in December 2004, just weeks before Mitra's murder. When arrested, both men confessed to killing the man and admitted to taking some money from his house, but vehemently denied any involvement in Mitra's case. Despite their denials, they were charged with both crimes. Vlado also covered the trial of the two men. In his report, he wrote, Handcuffed and with scrutinizing eyes, Ante Risteski, 28, and his friend Igor Mirsheski, accused of a gruesome double homicide in Kichevo and Malkitz, entered the courtroom. They stared at the ceiling with vacant expressions, occasionally whispering to themselves. It's over, they seemed to say. Now we will pay for our crimes. Both men were eventually sentenced to life in prison, despite the fact that the DNA found on Mitra's body did not match either of them. The possibility of a third attacker was never considered, and Kichebo returned to its quiet existence until another disappearance three years later. In early November 2007, Lubika Likoska, a 56-year-old woman, went shopping after her shift as a cleaner, but never came back. On February 3, 2008, a garbage collector found her body in a black plastic bag in a forest near a gas station in Kichevo. The autopsy revealed that she had been violently attacked with a cable, beaten, abused, and strangled. The most startling detail was that she had died just a few days before her body was discovered, indicating she had likely been held captive until shortly before her death. The police quickly linked her murder to Mitra's noting the similarities in the circumstances of the two cases. As they began to suspect a serial killer was on the loose, Vlado continued his work, interviewing the victim's families. Everyone opened their doors to him, hoping that coverage in the newspaper might help. They described Lubica as a kind and quiet woman who fought poverty by cleaning houses to support her children and her brother, who was in a psychiatric hospital. On February 6, 2008, Vlado published the story of the case, writing, The new crime is the talk of Kichevo. Rumors abound while the police work on the case. Most residents believe this murder is connected to the double homicide in Malkuts and Kichevo, where two elderly people were killed for a small sum of money. Initially, nothing seemed particularly unusual about a reporter doing his job. However, in the following days, Vlado raised eyebrows by publishing several articles that detailed how the elderly woman's kidnapping might have occurred. He mentioned an open window, a lit lamp, a surprise attack where the victim resisted, and even a stab wound to the chest. The detailed account of the crime surprised the investigators, but they attributed it 
to possible police leaks. However, three months later, a third body raised new suspicions. On May 16, 2008, a passerby discovered the body of 65-year-old Zivana Temokaska in a plastic bag atop a pile of garbage near the local soccer field in Kichevo. She had been missing for nine days, and like the previous victims, she had been assaulted, brutally murdered, and tied with telephone cables. The autopsy revealed three head wounds and multiple rib fractures. Two days later, Vlado called his editor, presenting his theory that this latest murder was linked to the previous two in Kichevo from 2004 and 2008. He laid out the information he had gathered, and on May 19th, his theory was published under the headline, Serial Killer Stalks Kichevo. The article read, The people of Kichevo live in fear after another murdered body was found in the city. The circumstances resemble those of a body discovered 20 kilometers from Kichevo last year, suggesting the possibility of a serial killer at work. By this time, the police had connected the three victims. They were of similar ages, worked as cleaners, lived alone, and had been found brutally murdered after disappearing. Moreover, the victims seemed to know each other. Mitra and Zavanna were even friends. The killer's modus operandi appeared consistent. Kidnapping, holding the victims captive to torture, beat, and abuse them before strangling them with a telephone cable leaving their nude bodies in plastic bags in remote areas of Kichevo. Additionally, there was the case of 78-year-old Gorisa Pavleska, a retired cleaner who had disappeared from Kichevo on May 30, 2003, and whose body was never found. Convinced they were dealing with the same killer, investigators decided to create a criminal profile. This time, Vlado did not get the scoop. The profile suggested a mature man of strong build and above average intelligence, living in the area where the crimes occurred, who knew the victims and had developed sadomasochistic tendencies in his childhood. With this profile, the police began to suspect Vlado. He not only fit all these characteristics, but had also demonstrated knowledge of crime details that were not public. Meanwhile, Vlado continued publishing supposed journalistic speculations about the crimes. He claimed Zavanna had been deceived by the killer, who told her that her son was injured which he used as a pretext to abduct her. He also wrote that one of the women wore a solid gold crucifix and described how the killer extinguished the light in her blue eyes. Furthermore, Valado revealed the exact positions of the bodies in the specific model of telephone cable used to strangle and bind the victims. The motivations behind the Kachebo monster's actions remain unclear. Both Mitra and Zavanna were friends and lived in the same part of the city. The police are interrogating several suspects, Vlado wrote in one of his reports. Vlado didn't stop there. He criticized the police harshly for alleged irregularities in their investigations and for implicating the wrong men who were serving sentences at the time of the murders. He reminded readers that both Ante Rosteski and Igor Merseski had denied committing Mitra's murder, but the police had ignored this. Upon receiving these reports, the police realized Vlado had fallen into their trap. Investigators had deliberately kept a crucial detail, the brand of the telephone cable, hidden. By revealing this information in his articles, Vlado inadvertently exposed himself as the perpetrator. However, the police still needed more concrete evidence to prove he was the true culprit. Forensic analysis confirmed that the blood traces found on Zavanna's body did not belong to her. With this new information, a long list of suspects with the same blood type living in the area was interrogated. After interviewing 150 men, most were ruled out, except for a few neighbors, a taxi driver, and Vlado himself. DNA samples were taken and compared with those found on the victim's body, revealing the shocking truth. The renowned journalist was actually the Kichebo monster. On June 20th, 2008, the police finally arrested Vlado at his home in Kichevo, southwest of the capital, Skopje. He was immediately charged with three counts of abuse and murder. During the interrogation, Vlado maintained his innocence and denied all accusations. But there was more evidence against him. The investigators found seven of his hairs near Mitra's body. Additionally, the coat found inside the bag with Zivana was identified as belonging to his mother. 
Despite this mounting evidence, Vlado continued to deny everything. When asked why his articles contained information that only the killer or the police could know, Vlado fell completely silent. While he remained at the station, the police searched his home in his country house in a nearby village. There, they found cords and ropes matching those used to bind the women, some belongings of the victims, and sadomasochistic materials. After gathering as much evidence as possible, they interviewed everyone close to him. These interviews revealed Vlado's life story, showing a pattern. All the victims were low-class, uneducated cleaners, just like his mother. It seemed the motive for the crimes was the resentment he harbored towards her. Despite the evidence pointing to him as a cold-blooded murderer, his ex-wife described him as a gentle, calm man who had never been violent towards her or their children, portraying their marriage as ideal. This sentiment was echoed by others who knew him. Even the victim's relatives who spoke with him for his articles never suspected his dark intentions. He came to our house. We talked. He asked for details. Who could have imagined that he would turn out to be the suspect, recalled Zivana's son. Vlado's colleagues were equally stunned by his arrest. One of his bosses could not believe it, describing Vlado as exceptionally calm and incapable of such acts. Other journalists characterized him as a pleasant and polite man who seemed completely normal. Even his editor was shocked when she learned her reporter was the killer, refusing to believe it was true. But despite what his acquaintances thought, all the evidence pointed to him, and he had to pay for his actions. On the day of his arrest, Vlado was transferred to a prison near the city of Titovo with a court order to keep him detained for 30 days while the investigation concluded. Besides being charged with the murders of Mitra, Lubica, and Zavana, he was also under investigation for the disappearance of Gorisa, missing since 2003. The investigators were eager to question him about her. However, just two days later on July 22, 2008, any hope of obtaining answers vanished. Fellow inmates notified guards that Vlado had not returned from the bathroom. When they searched for him, they found him lifeless his head submerged in a bucket of water. The preliminary inspection showed no signs of foul play, and his death was ruled a suicide. In his cell, under his pillow, guards found a handwritten note stating simply that he had not committed the murders. The police decided not to investigate further. How none of the inmates or guards noticed him attempting to take his own life remained a mystery. Vlado's death not only denied justice to his victims, but also left unanswered questions about the missing woman, who might have been the first victim of the Kichevo monster. The exact methods of his terrible crimes and his motivations, whether it was hatred towards his mother or a need for sensational stories, remain secrets that Vlado took to his grave. That's the end of today's case. Thank you for joining us on The Crime Storyteller. If you're interested in more intriguing true crime stories, especially from Latin America, be sure to check out our new channel, Latin Crimes. Click the link to subscribe and explore more mysteries with us. See you next time.